Gracias. Good morning. God blessings to each of you this morning as we worship our Lord. Welcome to those that are in the cars, in the parking lot, listening uh, via radio, uh, our short transmission uh, radio, and then those joining us by way of uh, Facebook and TV as well. God bless you all. This is the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, and our theme this morning reflects on the word predestination. And we're going to learn about that word as it relates to Scripture. Predestined by God's love. So our opening hymn is going to be, well, it's sort of a Christmas hymn, although I did take out some of the Christmas verses. Uh, o morning star, how fair and bright.
exaltation, tell the story. Great is he, the King of glory. Congregation, if you're able, please rise for the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. There is one body and one spirit. There is one Lord, God, all of us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of us all. As Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. Our intro it. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness, answer me, in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant. For no one can give his righteousness Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For your name's sake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring my soul out of And we pray. O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son, faithfully even into suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated, and uh, Sarah is going to read for us our two lessons. First reading comes from Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I, am, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in, our, in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us 
in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were, with, who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the, glory of, to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the, glory, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And if you're able, if you please rise for the reading of our gospel lesson. Our blessed gospel is written in the holy book of St. Mark, the sixth chapter, and I read for us verses 14 through 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he is Elijah, and others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came. When Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Here ends the word of our gospel. We continue with remembering our baptisms. In holy baptism, our sins are forgiven and we are granted a new life in Christ our Lord. We solemnly renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways. We confess the gift of faith in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I ask you anew, do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? Do 
you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we would pray. Almighty God, we give thanks that your Son, Jesus Christ, suffered and died for our sins. We celebrate with joy his resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven. We are grateful for the work of your Holy Spirit in us, which brought us to faith by baptism. We know that you are faithful in your covenant with us. Keep us faithful as well. Show us the way you would have us live. In Jesus, our blessed Savior, Amen. Congregation, you may be seated as we continue singing our hymn, O Morning Star. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In our lesson from Ephesians are these words, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. In love he predestined us. In one of my favorite movies, Force Gump, and I would imagine almost all of us sitting here have seen maybe Forrest Gump. Played by the actor Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump. And the movie is really told from a bus stop bench. 
In fact, that's what's on the jacket of the movie cover. And I learned as I was writing this sermon, it's actually based on a book. I didn't realize that. A book, Forrest Gump. Well, he sits on that park bench and he visits with people as they come along waiting for the bus to arrive. And he tells them his amazing story of his life. And they listen. And as he's sitting there, along on the breeze comes a feather. Thus the feather on the cover of your bulletin today. A feather comes floating along through the air and it lands on his shoe. And he picks it up and he opens his briefcase and he puts it into his briefcase and closes it up again. That feather reappears at the end of the movie when a gust of wind comes along again and he's holding a book from childhood, Curious George. And it pulls the feather out of that childhood book and then the feather floats on again. Tom Hanks later in interviews talking about that movie talks about the feather and the meaning of it and he said these words he said our destiny is only defined by how we deal with the chance elements to our life and that's kind of the embodiment of the feather as it comes in here is this thing that can land anywhere and that it lands at your feet it has theological implications that are really huge. You see, Forrest, Forrest Gump, remember that's how he talked? Forrest Gump was kind of a nitwit. But there's something about him that is so enduring that as you watch it, you begin to love him and cheer for him as he goes running through life. And he bumbles along in life and he turns sorrow into joy, hate into love, disappointment into hope, failure into success. It is the story about life and the question we all have, is life like a box of chocolates? Is life just chance? Or is there a destiny, a purpose, a reason for every activity under heaven? The movie ends with Forrest Gump standing at the grave of his beloved Jenny. And he muses to himself and he ponders and he theorizes that maybe it is both. Neither, not either or, but maybe both. Maybe both are going on at the same time. Some years ago when a member of mine was disappointed in something that was going on in his life, I shared with him a word from Ecclesiastes. These words from chapter 9. I have seen something under the sun. The race is not always to the swift. The battle is not always won by the strong. Food does not always come to the wise. Wealth does not always come to the brilliant. Favor not always to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. And then I wrote to him, remember this in life. Sometimes things don't always go the way you want them to go. But in this too we can learn to be better people. Across today is a crown tomorrow. 
Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes seems to indicate that there is time and chance in life and that these ha things happen to all of us. And moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. His moment. His time to excel. His hour to shine. The question might be, what will you do when that a moment arise for you? And secondly, when will you know when it's that moment and not another? It sort of reminds me of that old joke, and you've probably heard it, I'll tell it again. A joke about a man on a roof and there's a flood. And the flood rises up so high that he has to stay on that roof. He cannot save himself. Someone has to rescue him. And he prays, oh, he prays that the Lord would save him. And of course, along comes the first person in a canoe. Tells him, come on down. Climb in the canoe. He says, no thanks. God is going to save me. Continues praying, and the second person comes along in a fishing boat. Come on down, I will save you. No, God will save me, not you. Finally, the third person comes along in a speedboat. Tells him, come on down, come into the speedboat and be saved. And the man says, no, I've been praying here all day. God will save me. Well, he ends up drowning. And he goes to the pearly gates and he says to God, why didn't you save me? And God said to him, I sent you a canoe. I sent you a fishing boat. I sent you a speedboat. What did you expect, Noah and his ark? The point of that joke, at least for this sermon, is this. Don't miss the moment. The psalmist writes these words. Today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be glad. Today, the moment. That psalm, Psalm number 118, is often quoted in the New Testament. It speaks of Palm Sunday. It speaks of Jesus coming into Jerusalem. It speaks of the foundation stone that was rejected and has become the capstone. Jesus often would say in his ministry, today, in your hearing, this word is fulfilled. Jesus had a destiny, a vocation, a calling to carry our sins to Calvary and die at that cross and on the third day to rise again. That was our Lord's mission, his destiny. And he taught that to his disciples and he taught them too that they too had a destiny, a vocation, a calling. What did Jesus say to his disciples about their calling? He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and you will see the glory of God's kingdom. Angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Follow me and you will have an abundant life. Now don't misunderstand what our Lord means by those words, abundant life. 
Abundant life does not, in Jesus' economy, equate to maybe what the Federal Reserve chairperson might think of as an abundant life. A Wall Street banker. They might define an abundant life by capital gain. Good returns on your investments. Jesus relates it to something else. An abundant life of grace and his love and his blessing and his providence. The Apostle Peter, one time he said to a man who was crippled, he was laying, begging for alms at a temple gate called Beautiful. And Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold I do not have to give you, but what I do have I will give you in the name of Jesus walk. In my sermon here, I've got a little sidebar that I want to talk about. That gate called beautiful. There's something about that that strikes me. Beautiful. I went looking up that history of that gate, of what we know about it. The history is this. They think that that particular gate was also called the Nicanor Gate, named after a Jewish man from Alexandria, Egypt, a wealthy man, who paid for that gate. Jerusalem had 12 gates around it. And the temple, it is said from history, had 10 gates. And each of those gates was humongous. Nine of them were covered, overlaid with gold and silver. The Nicanor Gate, history says, was 60 feet wide and probably at least that tall, if not taller, like a door. It took 20 men to open and close. See, the temple was also a fortress, a last place to be if foreign enemies were at your gates. But that gate was not covered with gold and silver. It was made of Corinthian copper. And it was considered more beautiful than the gold and silver gates. Thus it had the name beautiful. The story that is told by the rabbis is that when those gates were made, they were sailing from Egypt up to Israel, Joppa, that area, to unload. And they were met in a storm and the boat was about to sink and they threw one of the sides of the gate over to lighten the load but that didn't calm the storm and they were about to throw the other gate into the ocean as well and when Nicanor saw they were going to do that he grabbed hold of the gate and he said if you're going to throw that over I'm going over with it and at that moment the sea became still. And that half of the gate was brought to Jerusalem. And here is kind of an interesting tidbit. The other side of the gate in Jewish lure is that it was swallowed by a great fish and later spit up on the shore. Reminds you of someone else, doesn't it? Jonah. The gate called beautiful. The Greek word for that is horaios. And what's interesting is that that word doesn't really mean beautiful. The root of it is the hour. 
the moment, the golden moment had come. That beggar that laid at that gate, his beautiful moment had come. The hour was ripe. And Peter stood there, and you can imagine behind Peter, that gate faced the east, faces Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascended and says he will re-descend. Over the crest of that mountain would have come the sun and hit that gate of copper and bronze, and it would have exploded with light. That's why it's called beautiful. The moment. The hour had come. Silver and gold I do not have you, but what I have I will give you in the name of Jesus. Walk. Was it coincidental luck that that crippled man was laying there at that moment? Or was it by God's design? God's providence? His destiny? What does the Bible say? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. In love he predestined us. In him we were chosen. You have been created in God's image. And you have been redeemed by Christ who is the very image of God. And you have been sanctified by His Spirit. The descending dove. And that brings us back to the feather. Tom Hanks said in the movie Forrest Gump that the floating feather motif in the film had theological implications that are really huge. And in the end, Forrest Gump taught us that the ultimate pleasure and purpose of life and for life is not the accumulation of wealth because he had it, but in the accretion of love. The gathering of love. Let me show for you the clip. I don't know, Mama with a ride. It's Lieutenant Dan. I don't know if we each have a destiny or if we're all just floating around accidental like on a breeze. But I, I think maybe it's both. Maybe both is happening at the same time. I miss you, Jenny. If there's anything you need, I won't be far away. In the Bible, we learn that God is love and the greatest of love. He is agape love, a Greek word for sacrificial love, the love that loves you so much it will spill its blood.
for you. God is love. And we are the children of God, designed with purpose, with honor, with dignity, with destiny, a vocation, a calling. Isn't that the good news? Isn't that the best of news? When tough times happen and you experience in your life your struggles and your difficulties, when it seems that darkness is all around you and in compressing in to extinguish your light, remember the power of Christ rules supreme. It's that light which is in you. He works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will for those he loves, even for you and for me. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift, Paul will write, that we should be called children of God, children of light, children of love. because that is what we are. Amen. Would the congregation please rise? The peace of God which far surpasses all hearts and understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. And we sing together a hymn, Holy Spirit Ever Dwelling. you may be seated and at this time our offering to our Lord is received. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, 
from the And if you're able, if you please rise for our prayers. Gracious Lord, we come to you and worship. And we praise you, we worship you. We give thanks for the salvation you have given us through your Son your plan from the creation of the world, our destiny to be redeemed and to be saved. We pray, dear Lord, bless us with your spirit that we might believe the good news, Jesus Christ, and that that good news might echo out to the ends of the earth. Gracious Lord, in our prayers, we rejoice with Chantel and Aaron Thompson at the birth of a baby boy, Briggs David. We continue to pray for Chantel, who had a difficult delivery. We look forward to Briggs' baptism here in our congregation. We pray for those under doctor's care, including Betty House, as she continues her treatments, Connie Mall as she recovers, and Carol Ulrich, from past surgeries, Steve Grunhagen and Barbara Henke. We also keep in our prayers Dave Keene, who has upcoming surgery, and also Lee Kassman, as he has a doctor appointment this coming week. We keep in our prayers, Lord, to those who grieve, we pray for this morning Linda Vogus, her sisters, her father, their family, Linda who at times worships here with us at the loss of her mother Naomi. May those who grieve be comforted with words of resurrection and life. We continue, Lord, to always keep in our minds our shut-in and nursing home and assisted living home members. We pray your grace and love might abide with them. We pray for our kinder house here at Redeemer, our daycare, preschool. We pray for the children there, the parents and the staff and our staff in need. We give thanks for the rain that fell in this area, Lord, and we pray for more rain, favorable weather as the crops grow and mature. We pray, Lord, that your goodness would rest in each of us, that we might shine out to the world that light that dwells in us, goodness and kindness, love and gentleness, the goodness of Jesus Christ, the salvation we have. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And together we would pray the prayer he teaches, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen and receive the benediction, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated. We sing Amazing Grace.
If you got a moment or two, I want to read for you an article from the New Ulm Journal. And it's titled, Vietnamese Americans Revisit New Ulm. If you want to go forward on that slide. I want to read for you the article and then a surprise at the end. Families sponsored by local churches moved here in 1977. Thanks to the compassion and elbow grease of volunteers from New Ulm churches, an 11-member Vietnamese family immigrated from a refugee camp in Malaysia to New Ulm in 1977. Two members of the family, Richard and Solomon Hun, and I'm probably not saying it right, but I'll try drove to New Orleans from San Francisco Bay Area and visited Judy and Marilyn Selner in New Orleans on Thursday. A retired Bay Area Asian restaurant owner who lives in San Jose, Richard came to New Orleans at age 21. Solomon was 11 when he arrived with his family. Solomon now owns a commercial building maintenance company and lives in Palo Alto. After moving to California, he earned a bachelor's degree at San Jose State University and an MBA at UCLA. The brothers said most of their families continue to live in the San Francisco Bay Area and have done well. I just want to thank the community and all the people for giving us the opportunity to come here and live, said Solomon. We've worked hard, but we're living the American dream. We've been thinking about coming here to visit for a long time. Solomon was quick to thank the Selner family for their help. When I got here, I didn't know my ABCs. They helped me learn English, Solomon said. Life wasn't easy, to put it mildly. A 1977 story by Beth Linen in the journal documented the family's journey to New Orleans that took more than a year. The family was sponsored by six New Orleans churches. Before the Huns arrived in New Orleans, volunteers from Holy Trinity Cathedral, St. Mary's, Redeemer, Our Saviors, the United Church of Christ, and United Methodist Church worked hard to paint and furnish a home for the family. Granted, New Orleans is on the other side of the world from Vietnam, but distance was not the greatest obstacle they faced, read the story. The family left Tra Vinh, south of Saigon, in 1977. A storm battered the small boat they rowed before they were captured by Vietnamese Coastal Patrol and jailed for trying to escape the communist-controlled country. The mother of the family, Chung Tai Tin, and her nine children were released after eight days and sent to work in government-owned rice fields. Her husband, Dang Zung, and her eldest daughter's husband, Ta Dok Tong, were kept in jail for two months. The children were not allowed to go to school. Jail time didn't shake the family's will to leave Vietnam. Vietnam, Vietnam. My mother and father felt they must go because of us, said Hung, the oldest son. There is no freedom in Vietnam, no future, only work. The Hun planned another escape by boat at night. Two families, totaling 29 people, including a baby, set out for Malaysia, a 350-mile five-day trip in a 42-foot boat in the South China Sea. The escape was successful. The family waited in a crowded, fenced-in refugee camp for the opportunity to immigrate to the United States, Australia, Canada, and France. With a U.S. government loan for a plane fare and sponsorship by six New Orleans churches, 
the family flew to New Alham. In New Alham, two of the Hongs began working at Kraft Foods, and one of the older daughters got a job at AMPI. That's where the article ends. I knew they were coming because um, the gal, Judy Selner, had called me the evening before and was trying to track down people, uh, including Pastor, um, I forget his name, Lumen, Pastor Lumen, who was pastor here at that time, trying to track him down to talk to him about them coming to New Alham. And so when I was here that day, I happened to be in the office in the afternoon, and uh, they came to the door, and they handed me an envelope. And they wanted to express their gratitude to Redeemer Lutheran Church and for what was done for them by this congregation. And some of you folks, I'm sure, maybe remember. And then when they left, I opened up that gift, and inside was $1,500. Reminds me of those words, you reap what you sow. And here's the positive side of it. You sowed good seed. Good seed for these people and how they have succeeded here in the United States. A gift that follows to our congregation. So God bless you. What a wonderful story, huh? And remember, God predestined you with love. Amen. Amen.